Hello, everyone. My name is Phil Thompson. I'm Deputy Mayor of New York City for Strategic Policy Initiatives. Welcome to the second installment of our new series, Reimagining Public Health for New York City. This series is a forum for people across the city to imagine how we can rebuild our city rooted in the values of racial justice, equity, and community power. This last year has been traumatic for us in New York City. This city was the global epicenter for the coronavirus. And within the city, black and brown communities were the epicenter of the epicenter. There's been a lot of grieving in our communities over the last year, and most of us are still processing. It's really timely for us to talk openly about this and to discuss where do we go from here. I want to note that the virus has affected every community. Recently, many Asian Americans have come under attack in our city. Some people have been led to believe, in no small part by our former president, that Asians caused the coronavirus. So many Asian communities are being traumatized as we speak. It's like an aftershock following an earthquake. Turning on each other is not the direction we want to go coming out of the pandemic. I would be remiss if I didn't mention the other trauma that black and brown communities have been struggling with over the last year. That is the 400 year old struggle against racist violence directed primarily at black and brown people. Andrew Brown Jr was shot dead in the back by sheriff deputies in Elizabeth City, North Carolina, just a few days ago. Why is this so traumatic for us when we're in New York, 400 miles away? It's traumatic because most of us have experienced the threat of racist violence close at hand, or else we know someone close to us that has. I attended an African Liberation Support Committee conference in 1978 in Enfield, North Carolina, outside of Rocky Mount, which is not far from Elizabeth City. While we were meeting, a 12-year-old black child was shot dead by a local white store owner. The boy had gone into the store to buy a candy bar, and the owner gave him incorrect change. The boy, who I imagine had been learning how to count accurately in school, went to the owner and said that he had given him the wrong change. The owner said, here's your change, in word, and shot him with a shotgun. I thought I had forgotten about this incident, but my body had not forgotten. It was still inside of me. It's trauma that never left me, even though I wasn't even conscious of it. I think that's what we're all going through. Our bodies are carrying a lot of accumulated trauma. Our bodies don't forget. And our bodies don't lie about what we have to deal with in this country. The good news is that the trauma inside of us can be turned into a wellspring of motivation for justice. We are even more motivated after this virus to make New York City a just city and to make the United States a just country. The good news too is that we are not alone. We have each other. What we've gone through, we've endured together. It's only by sticking together, listening, learning, and loving one another that we can change institutions and improve lives. Being together provides an opportunity for us to experience joy, a liberation from the burdens in our souls, because true joy is a shared experience, inseparable from our connections with others. Tonight's conversation is about collective recovery and wellness during COVID-19. These conversations are vitally important because we cannot build that which we cannot imagine. We will hear from a remarkable panel of leaders and advocates discussing how we can heal from our collective trauma explore self and community care, and incorporate wellness into our recovery. Thank you everyone for joining us this evening.
Thank you to all those who are watching and thank you to the New York City Health Department for allowing me to warm up the space for this important conversation. My name is Alonjo Uribe and I am a poet from the Bronx. As you know, we are in April, which is National Poetry Month, and I am honored to celebrate that by sharing this poem, the beginning to the end of everything. Let there be lightning and thunder and cracks of electromagnetic whiplashes among the sky. Let there be a glorious hallelujah and the shaking of the bedrocks in Rio Piedras. You just had to be there. My thighs crack the earth open, springing all the mountains back, bringing the lava straight out the core, through the mantle, onto the crust, and out to the cosmos. The writings on the walls were no longer writings, but music scriptures. Everything was in its becoming, including myself. There was being born, but we're talking about life now, like breathing from all parts of your body, like your heart growing souls, and your souls growing eyes, and your eyes bringing the magic from out the maple trees. That's what it takes to make me feel alive. This may only be a dream of mine, but I think it can be made real. Ella Baker. I um, hope, hope everyone were, was able to enjoy uh, the poem by Alondra Uribe. Uh, but I also want to thank uh, Deputy Mayor Phil Thompson uh, for the rousing welcome uh, and for helping to center uh, the space as we get started. Uh, and again, for Alondra, for sharing uh, your talent and your wonderful poem. Uh, I know that April is National Poetry Month a time to celebrate poets and their craft. Uh, and so we certainly wanted to hear your help center us in our imagination, uh, our vision, uh, you know, and and really want to thank the, for having your presence with you uh, anchoring our need to think about what our work is uh, towards a better future. Um, and so as you've already heard that tonight is the second session of our series. Uh, in reimagining public health in New York City. This series fosters conversation and dialogue about important topics facing public health in New York City. It helps us uh, to reimagine, uh, to build the city that we want to live in, uh, one rooted uh, in values of racial justice, equity, uh, and community power. Uh, in this conversation, we hope these recommendations will set us on a path for a powerful opportunity to make transformative change. So last month, um, we, we hosted our first session uh, and we focused on COVID-19, um, the vaccines, um, how we're building trust in the vaccines, but the important work of building trustworthiness in the institutions, the governments who are providing uh, these critical services. Um, and everyone who participated reinforced the need to be transparent and truthful about the vaccines. Uh, and not shame people of having mistrust of government uh, and, and healthcare systems. We talked about empowering and listening to our youth, um, how environmental racism contributes to health inequities in ways to better engage New Yorkers in their communities at the places that they spend most of their time. And so we've been really busy in incorporating a lot of those recommendations and the ideas that have come up. Um, we've looked into ways to design and implement strategies and partnerships uh, for community-driven messaging and engagement. And we've also thought about ways to be comprehensive in our methods of community practice by incorporating community feedback into our messaging and engagement strategies. But this is the work that we have to do. Uh, and tonight, it's no different. And so we're going to explore concepts, uh, strategies for collective recovery and wellness um, during uh, and moving forward uh, as we look towards a future post COVID-19. Our country is certainly different from others in the sense that we have not reconciled with our harmful past. 
Our inherited legacy is threaded together from slaughter, slavery, brutalization, the humanities of uh, Black and Brown and Indigenous, LGBTQ+, and other people's sacrifice for this country. Um, and so this is the difficult past that we have to heal from, uh, and this is the society that we live in, but we have to continue to figure out what our next steps are. Um, and we haven't culturally conditioned, uh, moved on from these situations, uh, and we're in constant survival mode, uh, and we're receiving these constant reminders uh, day after day, week after week, and certainly, um, you know, even as we are coming out of the the guilty verdict for three counts uh, for the Derek Chauvin trial for the murder of George Floyd, we are still reminded, uh, based on the the murders of Dante Wright, uh, Adam Toledo, Makia Bryant, uh, and Andrew Brown. Brown. Um, and so this is where what we're here to do. We have the, a conversation not only about the pandemic, the social and economic disability, um, but racial injustice as well. And we have an amazing panel of leaders and advocates who are going to help us frame how, we're, how we should be healing from thinking about collective trauma, exploring self and community care, and incorporating wellness uh, in our recovery. And so let me introduce this amazing panel and bring everyone uh, to the stage. First, I would like to bring uh, to the virtual stage, Dr. Mindy Thompson, Fully Love. Dr. Fully Love uh, is, is, is no uh, stranger uh, to this work. Uh, Dr. Fully Love is a social psychiatrist and professor of urban policy and health at the New School. Um, Dr. Fully Love has published over 100 scientific papers and eight books. Her most recent book is Main Street, How a City's Heart Connect Us All, and was released by the New Village Press in September of 2020. Um, already joining us on the virtual stage is Gabrielle Torres. Uh, Gabrielle is a multidisciplinary artist from Colombia, but currently lives in New York City. Uh, Gabrielle has worked as an educator, a theater director, and a community engagement artist in Colombia, um, in New York, and in Hong Kong. Gabrielle is currently an artist in residence at the Laundromat Project and is working on House of Dust, uh, a new project to bring awareness about substance use in Latinx square communities. Next up uh, is KJ Ree. Uh, KJ is the co-executive director of the Center for New Leadership on Human Justice and Healing, oversees the policy, advocacy, and training agenda um, at the Center for New Leadership on Human Justice and Healing. KJ is nationally recognized for her expertise in campaign strategy development, youth justice advocacy, and dynamic training designs for system and community stakeholders on cultural change, racial disparity, and leadership growth. We're also happy to be joined by Dorcas Adedoja. Um, Dorcas is a human rights campaign activate fellow and dot dash anti-bias review board member. Dorcas holds a bachelor of science degree from Emory University and a master's of public health degree with a certificate in social determinants of health from Columbia University. Um, their efforts spearheaded at Columbia Public Health in 2020 resulted in the launch of the school's anti-racist forward initiative. Dorcas currently serves as Columbia's forward accountability cabinet member and is dedicated to building equitable public health systems. And certainly last but not least, I'm really honored to be joined by L. Joy Williams, highly sought after political strategist, public speaker, political analyst, and social justice advocate. With well over a decade of experience in politics and over 15 years in public speaking, L. Joy has made a name for herself as a respected, intelligent voice in modern politics. L. Joy currently serves as the president of the Brooklyn NAACP one of the most generational diverse branches in the country. And so with that, I want to welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining joining us this evening. How's everyone doing? Good. Well, I'm doing good. Thank you so much for inviting us. Well, I need to type on a tweet. Everyone... All right. Um, so to kick us off uh, in our first segment, um, we uh, frame this first segment in the key learnings and sharing knowledge from the work that you've all been leading. 
and bringing your expertise uh, to the stage. And so I want to first start off uh, with the first question to Dr. Fully Love um, and really helping us frame what we should be understanding and knowing about collective recovery. Uh, can you give us uh, what we should understand, how we should talk about it, definitions around collective recovery based on the work that you've done uh, in this area? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, delighted to answer that question. So and when we think about collective recovery, we think about the recovery of, of the population, the whole population. As Deputy Mayor Phil Thompson laid out so beautifully, we've all been battered by COVID and um, all of us. So we're, we're grieving, we're exhausted, we're lonely, we're irritable, um, children are falling behind in schools, mothers are tearing their hair out. It, and so it's millions of people that are in this state of grief. 32,000 people in New York City have died from this pandemic. So how does such a large group of people begin to recover? That's what collective recovery is about. And one of the things that we know is that you can't do it one by one. We can't have individual therapy for all 8 million people in New York. It's inefficient. It's impossible. We don't have that many therapists. And furthermore, people it's not how people heal from this kind of thing. We have to get together. And how do you get 8 million people together? Well, you have to ask every single organization in the city, can you help? And the organizations can help one by one, basically by doing what they're doing, but with a new consciousness. And the new consciousness is pretty simple. How? What are the people that I work with? What are they coming to me? What's on their minds? What's on their hearts? Is it grief? Is it food insecurity? Is it rent? We have to, those are the kinds of questions that people are coming to our organizations with. And then we say to them, OK, let's work together to help all of us feel better. But th this work has to be led by the Department of Health. The Department of Health has to convene all the organizations in New York City and give them this assignment. The banks, the Boy Scouts, the churches, the cultural organizations, Lincoln Center, and the little church on the corner are, are all part of, of helping us feel better. So the Department of Health gives us this assignment, and then every organization says, what is ours to do? And it's in this way that we will cure the depression, the anxiety, the fatigue, the loneliness of the whole city. Thank you so much. And I certainly hear the assignment that you're giving us. And I think, you know, this yeah. is not a new assignment. So we've been having discussions about this. And I, and I certainly and I certainly hear the work that we have to do as an agency, uh, and there is certainly work that other institutions, organizations really have to step up uh, in thinking about what type of practice that they're going to embed and institutionalize and really supporting, um, you know, whoever they're serving, their employees. Um, and so I think this is a good opportunity to go um, up and to, to answer the next question. Um, so, Gabrielle, if you share uh, some of your strategies, processing trust within communities. And I know that is really important in the work that you do uh, to think about how your practice is centering and engaging the community in transformative ways. And so, on uh, some of the pieces that Dr. Fully Love has talked about, um, what are some of those practices that we should be thinking about? Um, I think the first thing that I would like to say is that in my practice, I like to think that I, as a cultural worker and an artist, I shouldn't engage with subject matters or with communities that I don't understand personally. Um, I like to start my work by just working with what I know and where I come from, where I come from as a an X man, as a gay man, as an immigrant, and understanding what is my position then inside of my own community to see how I can serve the best. And I think this is very important for culture making and for artists um, to understand to what point we have a vision of what we want to do versus what the community also needs and then move into inquiry, thinking as um, Dr. Fully Love was saying, asking, always asking and inquiring upon what is needed and how we can serve the best. That's, I think those are the main strategies that I can think of right now. Then thinking about centering my practice um, in transformative ways, I started working in art uh, with a very big, um, 
idea that I still believe in is that we are unable to truly communicate the best that we that we would like to to truly convey where we come from and who we are. And I feel that at all moments we're talking to ourselves or versions of others inside of our heads. Um, and coming from these, I've been obsessed with how we can create spaces of making culture and art that leaves in us space for other people to inquire upon who they are and then make their own, um, I don't want to say products, but make their own um, creations so that it, it comes into life. And I, I think that is very important thinking about holistic practice and my work always being exper in experimentation because what ends up happening is that I leave enough space um, for me to create art that is not inside of the parameters that people normally think about art, but for art that has enough space for people to make their own ways. So even inside of all of the workshops and uh, the activities that I create with community, there's always a boundary that creates context, but there are no rules into how to make it. Um, always thinking about decolonizing, decolonizing culture making and allowing space for community to truly understand their own culture and to inquire upon their own culture so that they can bring it forth and give it value and honor the community. Um, throughout House of Dust, which is a project that, that's still in development and one coming until June, we release a theatrical experience. We've been taking a very long time to truly engage and submerge and inquire upon my own community, myself being a Latin X man that um, struggled with substance use for a while and understanding not only what I think I know being inside of that community, but understanding what other people also need inside of the community and the work that has been doing through organizations and leaders and advocates and social activists that I as an artist don't understand completely. So that my vision is not only about an artistic vision, but it's an artistic vision that can function inside of a bigger system and allow for recovery. Powerful, thank you so much. And um, really, really a lot, lots of gems. Um, certainly want to just thank you for, you know, just sort of centering all of the intersecting identities um, that you bring to the space, because, you know, one of the things that you challenged me on when we had our initial conversation of like not focusing on the outcomes, right? That we're in this constant process uh, of learning, of doing, and really pushing ourselves beyond the boundaries in which the ways in which we've been, been taught. Um, so. Uh, you know, I, I really uh, want to thank you for for bringing that piece up, and I want to move to Dorcas because to this point around learning uh, and um, understanding and creating, um, Dorcas, if you can talk to us about um, how can we be most inclusive and responsive to students uh, in Black, Trans, and Queer people in collective recovery. Then I have a follow up question, but please, if you can share. Um, thank you for uh, having me and asking. Um, I think um, in terms of being inclusive of both um, students and uh, Black folks who are queer and trans, I think um, one of the largest things that needs to be done is moving beyond uh, vis visibility and other symbolic gestures and working towards providing um, a steady stream of resources um, for these populations, uh, particularly, uh, I think, when it comes to students in particular, there were a lot of roadblocks in terms of accessing city aid, um, particularly because students do not always have the identification um, necessary, uh, such as like a New York ID perhaps um, to access uh, aid and support. Um, and also trans people may also have um, ID mismatches uh, that have also come up and uh, been a roadblock to them accessing New York City aid. Um, however, I, I do think um, that confronting stigma and uh, hate violence also um, is huge in terms of uh, working towards collective recovery, as there are high levels of distrust of um, government entities um, in this community because of uh, the, the lack of um, empathy they have been shown in the past. Um, and studies show that 70% uh, of trans people have experienced um, 
medical discrimination when they did seek out care. Um, and, you know, and confronting that is definitely going to be necessary as we work towards recovery. Um, and it's going to require meeting people where they are, um, especially again, when they have justifiable um, distrust uh, and also uh, doing new things that have never been done before. Um, and my personal experience uh, losing my housing as a, uh, when I was a student in the middle of the pandemic and all that happened in the aftermath of it, um, inspired me to co-write um, a, a letter to um, the Mailman School of Public Health that led to the launch of the Forward Initiative. Um, and it was really a huge step in, in terms of the school doing um, things and taking action in a large way that they've never done before. Um, and it's resulted in what is now a permanent fund for students facing crisis um, and also uh, a permanent allocation of funding to support students who would like to do work in their community, um, such as uh, students who want to work at uh, perhaps nonprofits or federally qualified health centers that do not have funds to pay them otherwise. Um, and I think that's also work that is imperative um, to uh, working towards collective recovery as, you know, federally qualified health centers, um, particularly uh, places like Cal and Lord, APCHA, um, Community Health Network, and et cetera. Um, they are often the first uh, point of healthcare for a lot of people who typically um, are, um, you know, afraid uh, to access it, um, or, you know, they're either afraid or sometimes um, systemically kept away. Um, so, uh, with that being said, um, those are my points. Great. Um, well, you, you, I just want to follow up on something because you, you mentioned some really awesome organizations and know that uh, there's also some other work that you've been doing at Columbia. Um, and so in, in making sure that we can include, you know, the, the communities that are often overlook, overlooked, but specifically in you know, our public health work. Um, how how do we what are, what are some like one to two concrete strategies? And you mentioned some organizations that I think partnerships with healthcare systems are really important. Are there other other strategies that we should be thinking about um, uh, that we should you know folks should be including in their practice? Yes, I would say also working uh, with uh, organizations that I feel like. Um, are often not seen as doing public health work. For example, uh, nonprofits like, such as uh, Glitz Inc., they're um, a organization that has been providing uh, free housing for um, low income black, trans and queer people for, for years now. Um, and also, um, you know, community, community networks that may not have any typical organizational title um, have also uh, done a lot of heavy lifting throughout this pandemic in terms of getting uh, community members what they need. Um, so I think um, uh, a unique strategy would be seeing what can be done to help fund those networks of support um, and taking leaps of faith and doing um, a lot of things that have never been done before, uh, because for a lot of people, this is the first pandemic they've lived through, uh, not for you know everyone, but however, um, I think it's going to, a response to it is going to require doing things that have just never been done before. Um, and also focusing um, on, unique cross collaborations. Um, uh, and I think what is so um, innovative about what's happening with Forward at Columbia is that, um, you know, organizations that uh, typically have been kept um, away from Columbia in general now are able to access students, um, you know, for labor um, from the school. Um, and, and, and that's definitely something that can, uh, that provides extra resources. Great. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Dorcas. Um, so, so just, uh, move on and wanted to bring Eljoy into the space, um, and wanted to hear more about, you know, practices that have happened in the past, what we're learning from our past and, and just sort of seeing, you know, how is this in, uh, you know, impacting movements now. So, so Eljoy, what can we apply and learn uh, from historical movements to the current power building and community resistance and resilience for, for collective recovery? 
Yeah, so first I want to say we don't have a really good track record of learning from uh, history and learning from people's movements. Uh, so we'll, we'll start on the outset there, um, whether or not the city can move forward public health um, in general and not just isolating one particular, <laughs> one particular uh, uh, entity. Uh, but we don't have a very good track record of that. Let's look at what the assets were in our community during uh, this pandemic. We saw people come together to create mutual aid um, institutions within their community. They may have been Black associations, they may have been civic groups or any other uh, uh, functioning organized groups within community. And they came together in order to provide aid to their neighbors, their friends and constituents during, the, during that time. We also saw institutions um, and organizations as Dorcas uh, mentioned earlier, um, who normally wouldn't do say health related work or, um, but they did outreach. They engaged with communities and, co and uh, cultural institutions on a regular basis and recognized that they were trusted voices and trusted people within their community to be able to deliver information, to be able to deliver aid, and to be able to deliver services. So one of the things that we should learn from this is that we uh, as government entities, we as community entities, need to invest in the assets and in the infrastructure that exist in communities in order to be a trusted delivery system for whether that's education, whether that's public health information, whether that's testing, or whether that's a vaccine um, information or vaccine availability. Um, and some of it is, you know, learning on the ground and having the willingness to be able to learn and pivot um, as necessary. Something I know, um, Dr. Easterling, that you and I have talked about before um, in learning during this pandemic, we knew about the lack of investment in uh, black and brown communities to private um, and community-based healthcare systems that people already are used to going to that did not have the resources to provide testing during the testing phases. And we didn't immediately learn from that in order to make sure to provide those same institutions and doctors and individuals with the vaccine information on the early, on the early end, right? So there was this, this you know, um, uh, not being able to learn just from your immediate past <laughs> um, to be able to shift as necessary. And so one of the biggest takeaways that I, you know, want people to uh, uh, take away from this time frame is one, you know, to stop thinking of communities um, particularly communities that have historically been marginalized and not invested in, we spend a lot of time talking about the deficits, but they don't have, right? They don't have these institutions. They don't have this wealth. They don't have these um, linkages. Rather than investing in what do they have and how can we invest in that infrastructure in order to build it up and in order to support it so it can reach the people that they know how to reach. And we have different instances that's not only from a public health standpoint, but even from a civic and a political education standpoint that we can point to that that then works. Um, immediately pointing to this week on, from a civic standpoint to the census, when the city invested wholeheartedly in organizations that are trusted voices and have trusted infrastructure within communities across the city, we were still able to effectively do a census through a pandemic, right? So talk about the resiliency that can exist even through a once in a lifetime pandemic when you invest in infrastructure and community that already exists. So I would say what we need to learn from history, even from immediate history as much as a year ago, right? Um, it's how do we invest in what community, what community assets exist rather than only focusing on their deficits. Yeah, absolutely. And, it's, it's, and I think this is so perfect because, you know, just part of our series, it's also sort of thinking about um, uh, narratives you know, and I think that strength-based approach, looking at our assets and always starting from that position as opposed to a deficit model is something that we constantly have to shift. Um, and it's not always about, 
you know, swooping in and bringing in resources is really figuring out who are the folks that we need to learn from ourselves and who have already the answers. And so really appreciate you for lifting that up. Um, okay, I know, you know, I wanna make sure we could bring in KJ. Um, and so bringing KJ Lee, uh, um, co-executive director from the Center for New Leadership. Um, KJ, if you can, uh, you know, just help us understand how we should be thinking about operationalizing the work of collective recovery and justice. Um, given the, the work that you've been doing for decades, you know, really wanted to uh, bring that intersection point uh, as well. KJ, are you muted? Apologies. Um, am I on now? Is the volume on? Um, so I wanted to start by just um, shoring up and reverberating some of the points, a, just a lot of jewels. Um, one, I think how Dr. Fully Love started the series talking about kind of the, 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 the unique positionality of Department of Health, right? Um, all these issues that we're talking about in terms of really our human, um, human condition, it really falls, if there was an agency that it falls under, right, um, in a comprehensive and holistic way, it, it falls under public health, right? Um, it's about our health, our health being our wealth. So I just wanna shore that up. And also in terms of the, the I, want, I also wanna reverberate kind of the importance of resources, but how we pipeline those resources and, and, and with um, the, la the last speaker, um, Eljoy's point about the infrastructure um, that exists, investing in the assets and the infrastructure that exists in the communities. So I say all that to say, I'm gonna start out with kind of a, a, a overarching statement that I think this is an age when we talk about collective wellness and justice, there's a kind of an undergirding um, a tension um, or premise or assumption that something has gone awry. And if we're talking about collective wellness and justice, for us as Center for New Leadership, we're talking about ways in which humanity has been at best truncated and at worst decimated. So if we are addressing humanity and human conditions, then we have to kind of what I call, it's time for us to catch up to our rhetoric. So we have had the last 20 years of at least coming from where I work in the field of criminal justice reform it has been this like stupendous kind of massive consciousness raising around criminal justice reform, right? Ending mass incarceration. We have everything from uh, the new Jim Crow to thir 13th documentary kind of mapping out the history and the depth and scope and scale of, of the history that really undergirds the prison system and the, the system of criminalization. But I want to get, I, I, always I always say this, we can have beautiful talks on panels, but what it comes down to is practice. Paradigm, culture, um, transformation, happens through everyday practice and how we actually implement it. So I want to I want to tell a bit of a story first to frame it. 20 years ago, we called for no more prisons. Stop building more prisons. And then that got us into kind of all the different portals about why should we stop building prisons because prisons keep us safe. And that's how we tackle what makes us safe. What does public safety and justice take and what does it look like? And I'm gonna fast forward, not to go into these rabbit holes for now. So then from no more prisons, and we stopped the city of New York from expanding two youth jails by 100 jail cells each. We stopped the state of New York from building a maximum juvenile facility at a $73 million um, price tag. And then we started realizing, wait a minute, this is what oppression does, right? It keeps us kind of chasing our tails of like um, claiming as wins, stopping something that shouldn't have been happening in the first place. And we keep shoring up the outrageous data 
to expose the injustice, right? And it keeps us away from investing in and focusing in on and curating and creating spaces for us to explore our humanity, the expression, the conditions, um, and our representations, right? Um, and to really kind of um, it, it build, build that bandwidth. So then we went to, okay, let's reclaim these facilities and how they need to be community centers and informed by the community. So I'm gonna put it under reallocation strategy. So it was all about alternative to incarceration, programs, not incarceration, right? So then reallocation strategy happens, we pass some legislations that really is about reallocating funds from what would have been used for the construction or operation of these facilities to um, other things, right? And that in and of us was complicated because of capital budget and operational budget. And then we go to reallocation. And then you realize on the ground, the legislation is designed in such a way that a lot of the fundings are coming through government agencies. And who has the capacity and the structural right, history of having operated within the realm to absorb the funds, to apply and read through 70 or 100 plus page RFP, request for proposal, coming from a city agency, right? So we have a lot of rhetoric and I've been behind writing some of them, right? Data-driven, whatnot, but we have not invested in exactly what Eldre was talking about in terms of the infrastructure and the assets. We're not looking, we're not asking, we're not connecting, we're not building relationship and we're not learning. So then the same old organizations, not to not them, but same old organizations receive the funding. And we've been doing this for 30 years of criminal justice reform, $50 billion going in public health approach to um, violence or anti-gun violence, right? For 30 years, for the most part, if you track the zip codes of people who have been fueling the prison population, and if you look at the, the funding that we have into criminal justice reform, and if you track the zip codes of people who work and organizations that have gotten the benefit of these funding, the two zip codes, never be right so when i say operationalize our rhetoric is really looking at not just programs but really looking at people places and pathways right so uh, this is kind of one thing that we, we we say all the time it's kind of like a very simple truth the greatest what we talk about health is wealth and all that stuff but but really, um, the saying that people are the greatest wealth of any nation, and it really is true. Without people, where who are we? And yet, the way we invest in people, if you're going to invest in community, it starts with people who live in the communities. And the way we invest in people is what we need to examine, because all our conditioning and isms play out in the assumptions, and then therefore the ways. So operationally, so now I'm going to get to some concretes, right? So it comes down to nitty gritty and just how we operate. Um, when pandemic hit, one of the first things that we did was as we had to hunker down and stabilize, one of the first things that we went into, and we applied for a lot of emergency grants. And in the very beginning, it was really hard to get emergency grants for straight up cash assistance. And that's what we were doing. $150 a week of cash assistance because we're all hunkered down. And at the end of the day, people's situations are so different. And yet there were so many caveats and fear and barriers to giving poor people cash assistance, right? And that's something that we have to confront. That has evolved into our small, humble pilot of guaranteed income. We took the opportunity of the pandemic to build a platform and play out what we have been talking about for a very long time. And so we have $600 a month that we are giving to 10 families for 12 as guaranteed income. 
Um, and that is our baseline as we do that. It's not just cash assistance. When we gather, one of the most recurrent themes are things like just that kind of in terms of um, feelings um, like care, community care, um, the mental distress, the relief, and also the dignity of being able to care for others in our families and in our community, because all of us want to do that. So these are some themes. These are, when we talk about collective wellness and justice, I think ultimately what we're talking about is how do we create pathways and conditions for us to represent and demonstrate and express our full humanity, right? Um, so that's, that's where I'll end. I have other examples, but I'm not. No, oh, thank you so much. Thank you. And and thank you for emphasizing a lot of what people have said. If I think you really brought it um brought it home for us. Um so I, I'm I'm gonna move this on because I do know that some folks have a hard stop. Um and but I think that there is some like as you said, uh, KJ, there's some really strong gems. Right now we're gonna bring up uh, a quote uh from one of my colleagues, Jeremy Teller. Um Going to, who's going to prompt us with this quote, and then uh, I'll look for your reactions um, shortly after. This may only be a dream of mine, but I think it can be made real. Ella Baker. So from Ella Baker, this may only be a dream of mine, but I think it could be made real. Uh, so uh, Dorcas, I want to start with you. What what's your reaction uh, to this to the quote from Pamela Baker? Um, I appreciate it. I also think it has its own um, Afrofuturist theme to it, um, being that uh, I know Afrofuturism is uh, often about uh, it centers confronting um, ugly realities and using uh, the imagination to work towards. Um, you know, a better future uh, collectively. And I think that's um, what the health department is trying to do with this conversation. Um, and particularly about um, what I dream about um, in terms of where the city could move um, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, just collective recovery is, you know, a health department that um, is informed of the needs of um, all people in New York and recognizes that, um, you know, black and brown communities are expansive uh, and, you know, and that any decision that is made on behalf of a black and brown uh, community uh, resource allocation will impact um, people who are uh, black, queer, trans, queer and trans. Um, and also acknowledges that, you know, we have sex workers in our city. I think one of the best things that the health department did throughout the pandemic was release um, guidelines about how to have sex during COVID-19. Um, they went viral. I think it, uh, I, I know it was um, very well received by the public, both locally and nationally. Um, and I think more efforts uh, like that, that ground, um, that are obviously grounded in realities that um, people are experiencing will definitely uh, serve us well moving forward. Um, and additionally, I also dream of a health department that, um, you know, continues to stand up and fight against hate violence and acknowledge um, the murders that we have, of, especially of Black trans women, um, that continue to um, go on throughout the country. Great. Um, so, Gabrielle, I'm going to bring you in because I want to get your reactions to the quote and, and anything else that you want to add. Uh, cross collaboration um, practices, but really about this vision of wellness and joy. Gabriel, we can't hear you. I was saying that there are so many dreams about things that could be possible through culture and through upholding the culture of communities. Um, I think no matter what happens, and again, coming from, uh, coming into the United States, somebody who was an undocumented immigrant and who grew up in poverty, financial poverty, we, we always find ways of creating joy and celebration. The question is whether institutions provide the resources to be able to do that, asking us if what we need. 
instead of telling us what we need. And as a dream, I would truly like to believe that there's a future in which infrastructure and legislation can change so that organizations are also able to get funding to provide systems that are about inquiry within the community and not about results, as we were talking before, that are about process and that are about journeys and that are about seeing how humans transform and adapt to the necessities that they have in the moment, because we're never in the, the seconds never repeat. Life is always changing and we're always transforming. And we're always celebrating and we're always having joy. Um, now it's whether the infrastructure is upholding that to happen, especially instead of cultural organizations that come with specific agendas on the things that they need to create and that they need to do within the community with their own criteria of what culture is and what art is, instead of truly allowing the space for the community and the community wisdom to be seen, and to be honored and uphold. Thank you, Gabriel. Eljoy, um, uh, I, I know that you're highly sought after and many are uh, looking for your input. Um, can you share any policies and practice that we can use to recover um, which, but that recovery is going to be rooted in racial justice and community and some of the things that Ariel was talking about, joy and wellness. Well, I think the first thing is, again, you know, those answers come from the community and from the people themselves. And there are a number of experts, and I'm not just talking about those that have a PhD or, you know, um, some sort of title behind their name. Um, grandmothers can give you policy prescriptions in terms of what needs to happen as it pertains to public health um, and wellness in communities. Um, you know, children can give you uh, policy prescriptions in terms of what supports and what things that they need in order for their community and also for their school environment to be healthy and well. Um, and quite often, we uh, look to those of us, you know, who are policy wonks and sort of, you know, uh, know the history and know the legislation and language of things. Um, but being able to break away, that's where I get majority of what I'm advocating for is I get it from the community, I get it from the people. And if you're using, you know, uh, quotes and language from folks like Ella Baker, um, who again, Yes, a, a trained, you know, advocate and activist, but also one that was deeply rooted in people and deeply rooted in communities. And people know what they need. <laughs> Children can tell you what's missing from their school building. Children can tell you that they don't have internet access um, in order to be able to participate fully uh, in class. They can tell you that they have a better environment in school um, to be able to learn than they do remotely, at least some of them, and some of them could tell you they are actually better remotely than they are in school, right? So I think looking, um, again, within um, our communities and having them, having us at the table collaboratively together and not thinking of it as an afterthought is an important uh, part of a recovery. Um, and partly because Quite often people think as government and the agencies that operate on behalf of government is something that is being dictated down to you. And I think it's incumbent upon the agencies and organizations um, to think about ways where they can be on equal footing with the people that they are uh, charged with serving um, in order to get those fresh ideas um, and what's necessary and needed in order to produce the recovery. I think the last part is it's, and I think maybe Dorcas mentioned this in the beginning, um, that, or uh, that it's not enough to just have it, in, have it in language, have it in representation in terms of visual representation, that it actually has to be embedded in terms of uh, how the policies are actually implemented and addressed. Um, and so it, it takes work. You have to be an active participant in looking at how you are operating, how your policies are set up 
in order to make sure that they are inclusive, to make sure that they are equitable. That takes active participation and active steps, and it's not a, a, a passive action. Um, and so that's what, um, you know, I think going forward in terms of any recovery, be a health recovery and economic recovery, um, that we have to make sure uh, that we're looking at. Awesome. Well, certainly we're taking notes uh, and certainly want to thank you so much. Um, I know that you have a hard stop. So, I, you know, even if you have to jump off while we're going, I do want to just say thank you very much uh, for joining us this evening. Um, uh, Dr. Fully Love, want to want to bring you in and are there any additional roles, practices that we should be thinking about um, in collective recovery? I know that you talked about the role that New York City Department of Health should be playing in the guidance that we need to really put forward. What other roles should, what should others be thinking about, institutions should be thinking about? I, I really loved uh, LJ's list of looking in, in the communities for existing infrastructure, people and assets like that's really terrific. And how do we invest in those? And how do we invest in them consistently? Because if you invest in the assets consistently, the communities will be strong. Um, but there are two things that we have to be aware of. One is that not only have we had 400 years of bad policies, but we still have bad policies. So how do we stop having bad policies, policies that displace people, policies that destroy communities, policies that lead to upheaval? How do we stabilize all the immigrant communities? How do we stabilize all the queer and trans communities, how do we stabilize all the, you know, how do we stabilize everybody and connect them? These, these are things that there have been very deliberate government policies to wreck our unity, our solidarity, and we need to do the opposite. And the, the urgent reason we need to do this is that there's, uh, there's an, a pandemic waiting in the wings, and it could be much worse than this pandemic. This pandemic only had a death rate of 2%, which is terrible. But there are germs out there that kill 50% of people. What if that one shows up and we mismanage the pandemic to the extent we mismanaged this one, we'll lose a lot of people, we'll lose our society. So we have to be prepared. So all of this work, all of this investing in infrastructure, all of this getting people together, all of having joy and wellness and solidarity, all of this can save us from, from the next thing. And so we are investing in a possible future. As, and, and in a way, that's what I dream. I, I dream that there could be a future. I, I have a great grandson, Apollo, and I would like him to have a great future. Great. Um, well, before we move to Q&A, KJ, anything to add you know, uh, in reaction to the quote from Ella Baker or any other um, uh, points that you want to raise around collective recovery and roles? Yeah, so my seven-year-old daughter for her first grade um, class assignment, she picked Ella Baker um, and she, she wrote about Ella Baker. And one of the prominent points that we discussed together was how Ella Baker believed in leadership of the people, didn't believe that it should be about one person leading. Um, and the frictions and the tensions that she brought up in light of that, right? And I think this is the healthy tension. So I would, going off of a lot of what people have said, I would kind of uh, point to two things. Dream does not get realized overnight, right? It's not like we get to a point where, oh, now it's a time for like the moon and the star lines up and then the dream comes true, right? It, it happens through, I think, intention, practice, you know, exercising of and, and growing new muscles. So. I would point to two things. One is, um, I'm gonna put it this way, um, think tank space versus focus groups. Meaning, I think every time we have like collective wellness and community voices, we get into this focus groups frenzy. Um, and we get the input from the community, include the community voices, and then it goes over there, and then there's this like, um, separate space of researchers, well-intentioned and whatnot, kind of coding and wading through and this is what we heard. And what I always say because of Eddie Ellis, who's the founder of our organization, Center for New Leadership, and, and he founded it as a think tank. And part of that was revamping the terms and conditions of policymaking. And think tank space 
that needs to be the time, emotions, reflection needs to be done by the people who are closest to the experiences and the issues. And, and when we create that space and the longevity, the scope and scale, that's where the dreams actually come true, as Eldre said about the policy baking terms and conditions and the actual um, actual um, solutions, right, come from the, the dream making come from the people. So I think the, that's what I would say in terms of <laughs> we need to look at our focus grouping and, and, and create the people space. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you to you all uh, for, you know, uh, just just some really powerful um, information and wisdom that you shared. Uh, we're going to move to uh, Q&A. And I know that, you know, our time is short, so I'm going to seem like I'm just transitioning really quickly. But before I do, I do want to uh, just say and ask uh, all of our participants who've been tuning in and all the different platforms uh, that um, we're going to be sending out a post event survey, uh, really important if you can just complete that survey uh, at, at the conclusion uh, of this event. Um, so I'm just gonna jump into the questions and we received questions uh, on uh, from various platforms and the team has just been compiling the questions. So just gonna put it out to the group and if anyone wants to uh, respond quickly to them and others can jump in. Um, but one person had asked, what are some ideas to help people uh, with self-care, um, specifically now during this uh, pandemic? To the panel. Well, I would say the first thing is unless your doctor has told you otherwise, um, getting vaccinated is self-care. <laughs> um, and being able to protect yourself, um, your family and your community as necessary. And, you know, unless you're uh, doctor, I happen to know a few folks who, you know, who uh, whose doctor advised not to, um, but it's a very small number. Um, but, you know, self-care is also protecting yourself. Um, and so being able to get vaccinated to protect yourself and your family, um, practice uh, safe guidelines, because we need you around, not for you to do other stuff, but just for you to live. Um, quite often we tell people that we need you to be here and then we add the additional thing because we need you to do X. No, nope, we just need you to be here. Your presence and your you know, love, love and your walking this earth is, um, is what we need you to do. And so that is self-care. The other piece I would say um, in terms of self-care is being able, it, we're talking about um, uh, community wellness is being able to give voice to uh, what in your community needs attention. That community wellness um, of giving voice uh, to what your community deserves and what your community needs is part of community wellness. It doesn't just have to be the physical health, um, you know, of uh, individual people, but being able to say, how can I live in a healthy community? by identifying what my community actually needs or what needs to be invested in in order um, to be prosperous. Right. Anyone else in the time? In? All right. I, I see you about to say something. Gabriel, what are you, um, you going to say? Um, I think for me, I've been working a lot throughout the pandemic, um, and I think I personally, now I'm speaking from the personal, but I, but I personally started to get to a point where I had to, I was leveraging my humanity with my work. And um, again, just because I've been coming to the questions from, from the personal, thinking about how coming from a vulnerable community, we are always put in a sport where, we, where we're thinking about scarcity and where we go through struggles and those struggles condition us to live inside of that struggle and to not see our own assets. Um, I would say replacing the, the thought that we need to always be working with replacing, the, replacing it with, we, we need to be always experiencing and living life and having joy and enjoying the fun of being in life um as an inquiry 
and as a question every day to find our own personal wellness that has been really strong to me and, and something that I've been practicing throughout the past two months and that leads me into finding myself even inside of my own struggles of even when I'm doing the things that I know that are hard and that I wouldn't like to be doing at the moment, telling myself, I'm having fun, I'm living, I'm surviving, and it's good. And I'll also add um, quickly that I think mm -hmm. uh, journaling has also been um, excellent during the pandemic. Um, I know studies show that it actually does improve mental health over time and it's very accessible, you know, writing on paper or even speak. I, I know people who speak out loud to the, um, on voice notes um, and just documenting your thoughts so you aren't bottling everything up inside. Um, you know, a lot of people are still in quarantine and it, um, it's very easy to bottle up all of your feelings. So. Um, you know, journaling or even just having uh, healing conversations with people you trust is self-care. Yes, great, great. Um, so the next question, uh, and we'll start with Dr. Fully Love. Uh, what community-driven models for radical and resilient long-term recovery have you seen? And are they adaptable for COVID-19 is the question. Um, and, uh, well, I'm one of the people who is involved with a project called 400 Years of Inequality. And it was a project that called on the nation to observe the anniversary in 2019 of the first Africans landing at Jamestown in 2016. Um, and you can see, find this on our website, 400yearsofinequality.org. And, you know, part of that was just people telling stories. So I, I think the point is that every community that's been under the thumb of oppression has developed ways to survive. And so if you think about that 400 year story, or some people would say it's a much longer story, however long you wanna say the story is the story of black people surviving in the Americas is such a story. And all the tools that people have evolved, um, the, the you know many kinds of ways in which we pass on from generation to generation. What what do you do in this situation? Um, I was in a meeting earlier today and my daughter was in the meeting and we had a check-in question. And check-in question was, what's something your family told you about how to avoid a scam? Which was very funny, but it turned out my family had a dozen sayings for how to avoid a scam, which I thought was very funny. But that's part of it. it you know, what did your family teach you about how to not get cheated, how to protect yourself? It's so many, in all of our cultures, there's so much advice about this. So our cultures are rich with advice, uh, but we're not as strong as the capitalists. And so we get beaten up a lot. So part of this is about, we, we know how to survive. Could you take your leg off our necks? That, that's really the question. Absolutely. Um, KJ, any, anything to add there? I'll just add something short. I mean, whenever we talk about community driven, I mean, I think the undergirding um, kind of building block there and uh, foundational block is relationship. So we're talking about community. Um, we take for granted what what it takes and how much time it takes in the process of building community. And I think we need to unpack that more because I think there lies the strength and the power um, and the, the, the kind of the magic of our journey. So I think when we talk about community driven kind of things, I think we need to, how do people, how did people come to build community with each other? And I think there lies a lot of um, jewels. Right. Well, I think this, this question, I think you all touched on it at one point or another, and I think it's still a really good question to come back to the role of culture and collective recovery and wellness. How do we strengthen it? How do we support it? How do we nurture it in this process? Just open it up. I, I'm happy to speak to that. I, I think it's uh, largely because we had this experience with 400 years of inequality of watching, uh, there are 150 observances of the anniversary that people told us about, shared with us. And we've put some of those stories on our website. And it was um, how, how deeply people drew on culture 
to say this is this is a story we want to tell about our history, um, and and sort of all the different pieces of culture. Um, the, this the way just the way people pick a story as part of culture. So I I think what you could see in that was that the 400 years of inequality is a very painful story, but in this kind of of a holding space of culture, people could talk about these painful things with each other and could come to new awareness. And the proof of that was that the organizations that participated told us as COVID came and, and really slammed communities, they felt better prepared, better prepared to understand, better prepared to react, and better prepared to manage. So culture is fundamentally important and we have plenty of it. Uh, if, if there's anything we know how to do as people who've suffered from oppression, it's make culture. Agreed. Um, and I will, um, and the question actually makes me think of what uh, KJ discussed before about um, the mass uh, consciousness raising that has occurred um, uh, over the past you know, a few years uh, in terms of mass incarceration. However, I, I will also say that um, culture, it's small culture shifts like that that add up over time and uh, shape human behavior and eventually change our world. Um, and, you know, and if uh, cultures of oppression can be built, we can definitely build cultures of love. Um, and there have been people who have been working to do that, um, such as Bell Hooks. You know, she has a wonderful book called All About Love. Um, and that's definitely um, something we can um, work towards and that we are working towards here in New York by even having this conversation and bringing all types of people um, to the table um, and, and hearing everyone out. And again, investing in community assets, that's an, that, those are all acts of love um, that add up over time um, and can um, counteract um, you know, uh, years of violence. I think we can strengthen culture by reimagining what, what culture actually is. And, um, you know, I, working as an artist, I'm always thinking about what are the criteria inside of institutions and inside of specific places that I have to fulfill in order to be able to make my work and who gets to decide what my work has to be like so that academically and in certain spaces it is accepted. And I think that's what we need to work on in changing and decolonizing the thought that we need to fulfill certain criteria that tends to be mostly European into what art has to be thinking about art inside of culture um, so that we are able to celebrate different forms of expression as something that can be accepted and so that in the future we can start to think about uh, I don't know if I don't know how to put this but the conditioning our ideas on what art is and what culture is because by this point we all already have a common understanding of what we understand as art and how it has to be. And expanding that notion is, is very necessary, thinking about honoring and upholding um, people and community. Um, you know, art has so much value when it has a value to a lot of people. And what happens if we not only put value to a Van Gogh piece, but we put value to the work that is being done by a community member, by that community? it gets to have a bigger value and then it can serve as something that can be functional for the community to create economy, to create representation, to help in other sectors as well. Torian, you're, you're muted. I did the same thing. <laughs> Um, so, so thinking about industries and sectors, uh, you know, the, the work that we do, um, really interested in hearing you all's thought on this idea of recovery, but recovery in the sort of the return, return back into that could be workspace or community space. As folks are starting to have these discussions with friends and family and employers, um, wondering, um, you know, how are you all navigating the spaces in the environments that you're in? Uh, it would really be good to hear, you know, whether, you know, folks are reopening, are they rushing to, or there's that tension and anxiety, because I think that's also going to be part of our collective recovery um, as folks are entering uh, spaces together. Um, 
So wondering uh, uh, if anyone has any thoughts on that. I have thoughts on it. I, I think, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of a double-edged sword reentry, right? We want to do it. And, but, but we don't really understand everything about this pandemic. So if you think about India reopening and they thought they were okay, and now they're in this terrible, terrible crisis, um, which is low rates of vaccination and, um, and the fact that they had public gatherings, um, so, but, but it's also partly, we just don't know. We just don't know. Uh, you know, they have highly infectious variants. So at each stage of this pandemic, people have made decisions, different, a range of, every country's made a different decision. States have made different decisions. And some of them worked out and some of them didn't. But that didn't mean you were going to make the right decision in the next stage. So it's very trial and error. And so that to me means that we, we, we don't know everything. We're trying to figure it out. We need to move as slowly as we can. And convincing people that they should wear masks, that they should social distance over the summer, it's very important. At the same time, thinking about it from the collective recovery perspective, people are rather desperate for some fun. And one of the things that I've thought about, oh, I see a lot of heads nodding, like, yes, we're desperate for some fun, is Martha and the Vandellas and dancing in the streets. I think we could dance in the streets because New York has a lot of streets. There's a, a lot of room. You could just have socially distanced dancing. You, people just want to hear some really loud music and have some other people around and you will feel better. So can we move slowly but delightfully? I, I think this is, we, we have to, we're all ready to move out of captivity, but we have to be very careful because we really don't understand what the virus is going to do in this stage. Agreed, Dr. Fully love them. And thank you for that picture. And also for uh, being a medical provider who admits that, you know, there are some unknowns um, that are still going on. I think that's an, a fairly effective um, strategy. Um, and I'll also say, uh, you know, if nobody's given anyone permission for this, it's okay to come out of the pandemic um, as a different person uh, as who you are when it started. I think there are a lot of people who are also facing that as um, everyone has been in um, quarantine and has been contemplating, you know, uh, some people, well, not everyone has been in quarantine, but the people who have been privileged enough to quarantine, excuse me, um, have had a lot of time to contemplate, um, you know, their lives and their relationships and how they would like to um, perhaps do things differently or do things more or less. And, um, you know, it's, you know, returning and being and returning back to community. Um, a lot of our roles have changed. Um, and a lot of who we are is also different. So I think um, part of um, return will also be uh, acceptance of the new, um, because there was there were a lot of things about um, the old normal that were not okay. Um, and a lot of people are ready to change them and some people will be ready to hit the ground running and that's fine. I'm, I'm, um, KJ, what you're thinking about this issue of how we're going um, to emerge. <laughs> um, you know, for us, I've been thinking about this sent me to a whole journey of just all the conversations and the circles and the fights and discussions that have been happening in our little village. Um, this is what we call our organization and all those circles. And um, I think what's really important, we've definitely been kind of hybrid um, and we've had to, we have a whole range of um, sensibilities and beliefs and approaches. And I think, I would say we are going to have to create space. And, and and when I say space, I mean not just like some space. I'm talking about loop back time, um, the muscle, the muscle to loop back, um, and and really like kind of really listening and reflecting. Um, it's it's a very emotional or it, it's a very um, you know, people have strong opinions, right, about and, and, and stances and pivots around this stuff. But 
Um, we have to curate and create the space that is about time, reflection, and emotion that allows to evolve as 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 persons in light of each other. Um, so that's been a lot of process and journey for us in the disagreements, the distrust, and different opinions. And we can cite Department of Health or CDC or other kind of credible messengers all we want, but you have to kind of, um, you know, you have to allow that space for people to journey with each other, if that makes sense. That makes sense to me. Um, we we learned that Dr. Torian got Dr. Torian Easterlink got kicked off, so we're just going to continue. But perhaps I can pose, uh, you know, because uh, we're coming to the end, and I and I know sort of the last question is, you know, in one sentence, what should the health department do next? And maybe Gabrielle, you could start, and we could just do a round robin. Oh, there he is. I just posed a question in your absence, Dr. Easterlink. I said, what should the health department do next? <laughs> you knew that would be my question. Is that okay with you? I didn't even know you got kicked off. And now you're, you're on, on mute. mute. <laughs> on mute. What about now? Well, let's just keep going if you don't mind answering my question. Yeah, I Gabrielle, what do you? What should we? What should the health department do next? Engage in conversation. Engage in mm, conversation. I love that. Uh, I'll I'll go next and um, also say uh, engage in conversation. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'll say Wait. also engage in. Uh, I was told to wait. Okay. Um, all right. I was sorry. I apologize. I, I guess I hurt. Um, I think engage in conversation. Also invest in um, community outreach and projects. Just get as ex I, I would like to see the health department get as experimental as they can. Um, trust um, old voices and also bring in new voices. Um, both you know young, old, um, uh, formally educated, and people who are not formally educated. I would even say more importantly, um, and just bring them to the table and invest in their ideas and, and build from there. I'll, I'll go next. I, I think that just to build on this theme, getting every organization to say what piece they, what can their organization do? Each of us has a role to play. What, what, can, what can my organization do? What can your organization do? I'm going to invoke the three kind of key words that you guys, um, the themes that you guys are focusing on, right? It's uh, racial justice, am I correct? Racial justice, equity, and community power. Um, and I'm going to focus on resources. If we're going to engage in conversations, the terms and conditions under which that happens needs to be addressed. Otherwise, it's the same old people. I, I don't mean like old. It's it's same ones of us who have the time and the whatnot, right? And then also the ways, and there are those of us who have done. So it's not like we're starting from scratch. Many of us do it off the grid, on the grid, in terms of implementing the practice of how do we really value and resource um, the things that we value and the people we value. Um, and so that's what I would say. I would say be courageous. I would say tackle equity head on operationally um, and invoking El Joy as the whole range of folks on the ground who have and who are um, uh, implementing this. Torian, you're muted. Uh-oh. What about now? Better? Hey. 
Let's try this. Um, it was really good to, to, to hear. It was really good to hear sort of the summation of everyone's remarks. Um, certainly, it's important for us to be thinking about, and I just want to just um, uh, sit on some of the points that have been shared with us about exploring our humanity, um, really thinking about how we're shifting away from some of the existing structures in a way that we're thinking about this work um, and really building um, power and investing into the infrastructure within community. I, I think that's why we're doing this conversation. We're fostering this dialogue. And I think this is the opportunity not only for the health department, uh, but for you know this work that we are all doing together uh, to really promote the health of all um, that we serve. Uh, and so uh, just really want to thank all of you uh, for um, your, your wisdom, for the remarks, uh, certainly for the responses that you shared uh, uh, this evening. And so um, with that, I do want to bring to the stage uh, uh, my colleague, the virtual stage, my colleague and comrade, Dr. Michelle Morris, uh, who served as the chief medical officer and also the deputy commissioner for uh, the Center for Health Equity and Community Wellness uh, to now come with come to the virtual stage and close us out. And so thank you for this remarkable evening to our amazing panel, uh, Dr. Mindy Fullove, Gabriel Torres, KJ Ree, Dorcas Adedoja, uh, and also Eljoy Williams who had to leave us early. Dr. Morse. Thank you so much, Dr. Easterling. Uh, it is an honor to get to close out this incredibly distinguished panel, this inspiring um, discussion, um, the ideas that were elevated by the panelists, um, the facilitation, um, all of it. I just um, am amazed by the way that this conversation builds on uh, our first conversation in the series. And, and I feel even more confident um, at the end of this second um, conversation in the series that we are creating a new vision for public health in New York City. Um, so just a deep appreciation. I wanna um, lift up just a couple of the comments um, um, Dr. Easterling, you started out uh, by describing the fact that we have to build the city that we want to live in. Um, New York has done that historically and we're about to do it again. <laughs> this is what this moment um, is calling us to do. Um, and I believe the panelists just really described a beautiful path forward for that. Dr. Fully Love specifically lifting up collective recovery, the human condition, um, and the important role of the health department in this, um, in creating a space for this conversation. Um, for Gabriel Torres, lifting up the need to decolonize um, and envision forward, uh, and again, be creative in how we do that. Um, Dorcas um, Adejoda, um, for lifting up the need to activate and organize and how each of us can be actors ourselves in that work, um, in the work of activating um, around the reimagining of public health in New York City. Um, Eljoy Williams for lifting up mutual aid and the important process of active inclusion um, in all of our processes and how we reimagine and rebuild. Um, and KJ for talking about the need to invest in assets, um, in the importance of cash assistance that can't go away, um, and the need for us to invest in our infrastructure as well. Um, all that, those are just tiny highlights of, of the expansive conversation um, and comments and vision that you all propose forward. Um, I really um, am leaving in my mind and in my heart thinking about how we move um, out of captivity um, and into dancing in the streets, um, how we emerge in a way that brings in um, a space for experimentation, um, all kinds of voices um, that have maybe been historically included, but certainly don't need to be uh, excluded any further. Um, and I just really appreciate all of you for, for the beautiful, um, beautiful words. I, as Dr. Easterling mentioned, we we're serious when we said we were taking notes. Not only did I take notes, but our whole team is taking notes and we really do intend to continue to amplify these comments, your vision um, and build together across the four part series. Um, and with that, um, I will close by inviting all of you um, to do the third part in our series of reimagining city. It's gonna be held 
6 p.m. Um, we hope to see all of you there. Um, and we hope that you'll again need questions and continue to be a part of this conversation, uh, this series of conversations. Thank you. Um, be well. Um, and see you on May 26th at 6 p.m.